That is People of the State of Michigan versus Jonathan Timler. Will the parties please introduce themselves for the record? Ms. Wilson. Abigail Wilson for the people. Ms. Smith. Sherry Smith on behalf of my client, Jonathan Timler, who is seated to my right. And sir, you are Jonathan Philip Timler, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. <laughs> this is time set for a preliminary examination today. Uh, Ms. Wilson, how we proceed? Thank you, Your Honor. This is going to be a plea to count three. Upon successful plea, the balance of the complaint would be dismissed. The people would have no objection to 7694A if the defendant is deemed eligible. And there is a killer to no upfront jail. So, Ms. Smith, I'll restate that. And you can correct me if I misunderstood anything. My understanding of the plea is a plea to count three. The count three, counts one and two will be dismissed as a part of that plea agreement. There is no objection to 769 for a status if eligible. And there is a Killebrew agreement between the lawyers of no upfront jail. Is that correct, ma'am? Your Honor, that is correct. Um, one other thing that we discussed was she will not oppose our motion to having the no contact order lifted. So I just wanted to say that for the record. Is that, is that for Ms. Wilson? That is correct, Your Honor. And Ms. Timler, Mrs. Timler is here in the court and she does have um, a request as the no contact order whenever the court's ready. All right. And did you want the victim to speak uh, before the plea is taken or after the plea is taken? I think after the plea would be good. Is that all right, Ms. Smith? That's fine, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Timler, you've heard everything that's been placed on the records uh, by uh, your counsel. Uh, is that your understanding, sir? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Order of fingerprints. Has that been done? Yes, Your Honor. That okay. was done the day that I got. Off All, right. Off. All right. Ms. Smith, may I inquire of your client of his misdemeanor tri uh, trial rights? You may, Your Honor. All right. And then I have a advice of rights form uh, that goes through the 12 rights, uh, Mr. Timler. Uh, this, was, this was as a part of the file. And you signed this at the bottom, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Right, so I'll only go over the three main rights with you. You understand you have a right to trial by jury today. Yes. You understand that you have a right to counsel. You are represented by attorney, Ms. Smith. Yes. I got to do better than that. So attorney, Sherry Smith, uh, and she would be present to cross-examine any witnesses or contest any charges brought against you by the people of the state of Michigan. You understand that, sir? Yes, Your Honor. You, don't, you also... Uh, have the right to not take not to take the stand against yourself. Do you understand that? All right. If your plea is accepted, you'll giving it. You'll give up. The, you'll give up the claim that the plea was a result of any promises other than the stated plea agreement or threats that it was not your choice to plead guilty. And you'd also be giving up the right to appeal any issues from a trial, since you won't be having a trial. You'll be pleading guilty instead. Is it your intent today to plead guilty to count three of the offense? Uh, uh, count three, which is a misdemeanor, 93 days and or $500. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm going to have you raise your right hand. You solemnly swear or affirm. Tell the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury. Yeah. All right. I'm going to bring your attention back to March 5th, 2024, at the offense location of 3325 West Holmes Road in the city of Lansing, Ingham County. Were you at the Holmes Road address in the city of Lansing on March 5th, 2024? Yes, Your Honor. Right. And uh, who is Alicia Timler to you? She is my wife. Okay. And you are pleading today to offensively having contact with Ms. Timler that was not in self-defense. Yes, Your Honor. Can you tell me what happened in regards to Ms. Timler? Uh, we were in the middle of an argument and I got, I got mad, I got angry, and huh? I pushed her. All right. And you, when you pushed her, you did so intentionally? Yes. And you did not do so in self-defense? Okay, thank you. Anything towards a factual basis, Ms. Wilson? Uh, just one thing additionally, um, Mr. Timler, um, 
when you pushed um, Ms. Timler, she did not want to be pushed. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Anything else, Ms. Smith? Nothing further, Your Honor. All right. I find the factual basis to be knowing voluntarily and accurately made. Um, I will set this for probation uh, to be referred to uh, for the 769-4A eligibility requirement. Uh, there is a kilobrew agreement of no upfront jail. So, Mr. Smith, if I was not to follow that uh, in regards to the kilobrew agreement between the lawyers of no upfront jail, you'd have the opportunity to withdraw your plea. Do you understand that, sir? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, there's no reason why I wouldn't if the lawyers believe that that uh, if that's an issue here. But I want you to have that option if I don't follow the Kilbrew agreement. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. All right. Ms. Wilson, did you have a complaining victim here that wanted to be heard? I do, Your Honor. Yes, Alicia Timler is here. All right, Ms. Timler, I'm going to have you, you can stand right there, right on the corner there. All right. But no, you're fine. And you can spell your first name and your last name for the record. Uh, Alicia Timler, A-L-I-S-H-A-T-I-M-L-E-R. All right, ma'am, you wanted to be heard on the no, no contact order today, yes. is that correct? All right, you can proceed. Okay. Uh, tell me what, what you want me to hear. Um, I just have a, I wrote a letter. All right. Can I read it? Sure. Okay. Um, I've written this a dozen times trying to find the right words to say. I could go on and on about the situation, but I will keep it short and simple and to the point. To start, I cannot express to you how hard it's been not having my husband, Jonathan, home. This has been the longest month of my life. I've never felt depression like I do now. I'm asking the court to please let my husband come home to me and our children. I think these charges may have got out of hand and I didn't want any of it to get this far. I do not fear being in contact with Jonathan. He has not caused me any harm or trauma. Uh, I'd rather these charges just be dismissed. Me and our children depend on Jonathan for many things. and a stay-at-home mom while he is the one who works and brings home income. We own a home together and not being able to speak to him has made our finances extremely difficult. I also have a lot of physical limitations to where it makes me very hard to do some day-to-day -day things. These are things that I depend on Jonathan for to be here to help me. Him not being home has forced me to push my physical limitations to get things done, causing me severe pain. Jonathan is a very involved father and supportive husband. Please end my emotional and physical suffering and let him be free to come home. Thank you. Thank you. Is that an original or a copy, man? Um, I, I typed it up. Okay. And I signed it. All right. I, I would get a copy of that okay. to provide to the probation department. Okay. They're going to ask you your, your opinion on the no contact order. Uh -huh. And I want you to give them a copy of that to share that with them. Okay. okay. Sure. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Yep. And your honor, I also have a longer version that Ms. Timler um, sent to me. I can provide that to probation right. as well. All right. Um, so I'm going to refer to probation. Mm -hmm. uh, for a pre-sentence and a sentencing date of June 6th at 830. All right, it's June 6th at 830. Um, what I will do is when probation contacts me with the letter as a part of the file, I'll lift the no contact order. I just need it to come from probation. Okay. I think that's, they need to hear from you. They want to have it in the file. Um, and that can be before the June 6th date. Okay. It doesn't, I, we don't have to wait for June 6th. So get that, get that to probation department in a relatively expedient format as fast as you can. Uh, so we can get it there. Um, uh, there, uh, Ms. Smith, are you, you're familiar with the probation department here. I don't want them to take any time. I just want them to review the document before uh, before, we, before we lift the no contact order. That, that was going to be my question was whether you wanted, because I know the PSI usually doesn't get done until like the week before sentencing. That's my fear. I don't want to wait yeah. till June 6th to do this. I want to do this in a reasonable time, but I don't. But I don't want to do it without the probation having a chance to review it and look at it. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Smith. Your Honor, you kind I, of based some of the plea on this. I can talk to probation. Okay. Um, I would prefer it be in your discretion, but I can go down after this hearing and speak to probation and see if they could yeah. look at it today. Or at least at least take the copy of it so it's in their file or something, so that so I get from probation. 
that they're not because I'm going to lift the no contact order based on what she said. It's just a matter of when. And I and and do we not want to just do it today. No. Well, that's what I'm asking you. I have no objection. To All that. right, because uh, I can lift the no contact. I just I I put myself in peril by 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 not having the probation department indicate that they've received something. Uh, but I, I believe the, the victim statement states for, uh, on the record. I believe that I've got everything right now. Um, so I'm kind of looking for some guidance from, from yourself and from Ms. Smith. Uh, right now, I have no objection to the no contact order being lifted right. right now. Um, I can, as soon as I get off the record here, email the head of probation. Why don't we, since it's a condition of the plea agreement, let's, uh, let's have the no contact order lifted uh, with uh, and then we'll await the confirmation from the probation board. Okay, so it's it's fair enough. It's temporarily lifted until unless you hear otherwise from probation. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Your Honor, I just want to state on a, he is on tether, so I don't know if he. I don't want. Yeah, I don't want to violate. I don't want a violation and uh, some ambiguous violation because of that. That's my. That's this is exactly my fear. Okay. My fear is that they violate him. We come here uh, because he's still on tether, um, and I and on on some level, I'm reluctant to lift the GPS tether. I mean, I'd have to lift everything right now, and I guess um, I guess I'm unwilling to do that without a letter from the probation department. But I don't want him to be violated needlessly. I guess so. My next thought then is, if Mrs. Timler goes downstairs like right now, gives it to probation. And then probation calls you like today. How about how about uh, how about um, uh, um, no, uh, the no contact order and GPS lifted upon confirmation from the probation department? Okay. And then we can do it that way, yep. and then we don't have to wait till June six. Okay. okay. So no contact and GPS tether lifted. upon probation content contacting the court. Because uh, my greatest fear is that we needlessly have a probation violation mm -hmm. when I've lifted the contact order, but the GPS is still out there and we got a problem. Let's get everybody on the same page. Okay. All right. All right, uh, so I'll await confirmation on the no contact order and GPS tether being lifted from probation when they contact me. We've set this for June 6th for, uh, for sentencing. So what they're gonna do is go down to probation, give them all the information. They're gonna do a report. And then on June 6th, we'll see what options are available to us. All right. All right. Uh, anything else for the record in 2400632, Ms. Wilson? Not from the people. Uh, Ms. Smith. Nothing further, Your Honor. All right. Ms. Smith, you're with Bailey and Terranova. I did not know that. Yes, I just made the jump over from Andrew. Really? Um, I've known Erica Terranova for years. She mentioned you. I've known her mom for years. Uh, so, yeah, give them my best. Okay? I will do that. All right, thank you. Mr. Billabay, you are now with the Ingham County Prosecutor's Office. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, congratulations. I read that someplace. So, oh, did you come from up north? No, I came from um, Calhoun County, Battle yeah, Creek. Yeah, so, uh, out west. Yes. Okay. Out west. Well, yes, your enjoy your stay. Thank you. I will. It's good to see you. Good to see you too, Your Honor. <laughs> Is Mr. Payne, Mr. Sartz? Yes, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so we're on the record in docket 2400396, 
That's People of the State of Michigan versus Mark Anthony Payne. This is an adjournment from a previously uh, pre previous uh, uh, prelim in which Detective Sarah Wilson testified one exhibit was entered. And then this is the re uh, the continuation from that. Will the parties please introduce themselves to the record? Uh, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Your Honor. Melanie Smith, Assistant Prosecuting Attorney on behalf of the people. And Mr. Sartes. Good morning, Your Honor. Jacob Sartes, the fourth Assistant Public Defender here on behalf of Mr. Payne for the continuation of this preliminary examination. The preliminary examination uh, was initially covered on Mr. Behane, uh, Mr. Payne's behalf by uh, Stephen Cornish. However, I am the attorney record on, on this file and I will remain as Mr. Payne's attorney moving forward. Thank All right. You. And that's my notes would indicate that the chief, uh, it's Deputy Chief, I think. Mr. Cornish was here uh, representing Mr. Payne. And sir, you are Mark Anthony Payne, is that correct? Right. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Wilson, anything to come to the court's attention before we start further proofs? Yes, Your Honor. Actually, there is one um, item. Rosemary Milliken, uh, the victim in this matter, she is present here in the courthouse. She wanted to ensure that she was uh, compliant with the court's order. She asked me to ensure that um, you knew she was here. However, she is refusing to come into the court uh, or testify, but she did want to ensure that you knew she was here um, so that uh, she was not disregarding your order to appear. All right. I understand. Um, I think the detective testified last time. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Right. All right. And I do have an additional witness today um, and intend to continue proceeding. Uh, I just wanted to make that a preliminary record so that I could um, go ahead and release her from her subpoena as she refuses to testify. All right. Uh, Mr. Sartz, anything along the releasing of the subpoena for Ms. Mulliken, who's here, but uh, she does not want to testify today? Well, um, you know, certainly that, that's unusual that she would show up but then refuse to testify. Um, you know, I would certainly, you know, expect that she would provide a statement, I suppose, to preserve the issue. Uh, the defense would have objected to her being released without some type of explanation as to why she doesn't want to testify, but I'll leave that to the court's discretion. Uh, certainly, if the prosecutor intends to try to introduce her statements under 768, 27, uh, B and C, then I'm going to raise the issue right now. I think that would be a, a flagrant, uh, you know, I, I would object immediately to that, especially in the grounds that she's here and she could provide, possibly provide her own uh, statement uh, rather than the statement that was, that is anticipated to be potentially introduced uh, through the officer. So to avoid an issue uh, on, on due process grounds, I suppose, on behalf of Mr. Payne, you know, I will be objecting to the use of uh, some, any statements uh, through Officer Ullman uh, on the grounds that she's here and she can testify if she wishes to do so. All right. uh, among other reasons, of course, I would be objecting to any testimony through 768-27C. Uh, uh, so to preserve my client's uh, rights under these circumstances, I'm just gonna state that objection now. Uh, that if, if the prosecutor intends to try to bring in Officer Alman's statements, then I expect I will be uh, in, requesting to call uh, the witness and, and have her potentially testify to see if what she uh, allegedly testifies to is truthful today or if there's some massive inconsistency with what she told the officer back then or, or whatever else. But I, I certainly anticipate objecting uh, to releasing her from the subpoena if the prosecutor really intends to try to bring in her statements or hearsay statements through 76827C. All right, response, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Your Honor. I do intend to bring in um, statements made by Ms. Milliken, not only under uh, 27C, but as well as to the medical exception to hearsay um, through the medical records. Uh, I understand that Ms. Milliken's presence here is different than the usual course of business when we're introducing hearsay statements. However, it is irrelevant to the analysis of whether or not they're admissible. Um, presence or availability of a witness is not anything that the court needs to consider at a preliminary examination for either of those purposes. Um, I'm perfectly fine with the court not releasing Ms. Milliken from her subpoena. Um, and if the court wants to make some attempts to get her into the courtroom to make a statement, um, I'm perfectly fine with that, but I'm not going to physically force her into the courtroom to make a statement. Right. Uh, I, uh, I'm not going to release her uh, pending the preliminary examination 
uh, but whether she chooses to testify or not, you're absolutely right. She can choose to testify or not. Uh, we will address anything else concerning uh, the uh, the 76827 c at the time uh, that there's a motion to admit under that hearsay uh, statute uh, and, and, and any other uh, and any other hearsay that comes in uh, uh, pursuant to your 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 uh, proofs today. But of course, they are the Ingham County prosecutor's proofs. And so we'll, we'll let the Ingham County prosecutor proceed with the proofs in this matter. Um, the are there. I'm going to leave a motion to sequestration of the parties. So if you see anybody here that shouldn't be here, Ms. Donnelly's here. So I, I know I don't I know where she's from. Um, uh, let me know and I'll I'll invoke the sequestration order. Uh, you know your case better than I know Mike. Than, than I know your case. Understood, Your Honor. All Thank right. You. All right. So people would call then Trevor Allman, um, and I'm going to invite the detective to sit with me at council table. All right. Previous. Any of stand up here, officer? Please tell, state your first name and last name and spell them both for the record. Uh, first name Trevor, last name Allman, T R E V O R A L L M A N. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm? Tell the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury. I do. All right. Have a seat. Please project for to the back for uh, so we can hear you. And the microphone is for the recorder so, so she can take down what you're saying. Uh, Ms. Smith, when you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Allman, can you please tell me what your occupation is? A police officer for the city of Lansing. How long have you had that job? Uh, almost six years. <clears throat> Were you working in the capacity of a Lansing police uh, department officer on December 9th of 2023? Yes. And on that date, were you dispatched to 910 American Road? Yes. And what is located at that address? The Super Inn Motel. Is that a uh, location that you're familiar with in your capacity as an officer? Yes. Is it in the city of Lansing? Yes. And is it in Ingham County? Yes. Do you get dispatched to this uh, business often? Yes. What types of calls do you usually respond to at this address? We have almost every type of call. We have uh, shooting calls. We have assault calls. We have drug and narcotic related calls. We have uh, domestic calls, theft calls. Fair to say you're quite familiar with the business. Yes. Uh, fair to say you're acquainted uh, somewhat with the people who stay and reside there. Yes. And on December 9th of 2023, what was the reason for the call that day? Uh, dispatch sent me to a call for service for uh, a woman calling saying Mark Payne was trying to steal her vehicle. And dispatch noted that they could hear what sounded like an argument uh, with a male in the background of the call. Did you come to learn who the person making that phone call was? Yes. And what is her name? Rose Marie. Do you recall the last name? I believe so. Is it Milliken? Okay. And did you make contact with uh, Miss Milliken on that date? Yes. Do you recall approximately what time you arrived? Uh, the dispatch call for service was approximately 1230. PM or AM? Uh, PM. And when you first made contact with Miss Milliken, uh, can you describe her overall demeanor? Yeah, she uh, seemed panicked. She was kind of all over the place, um, you know, telling me part of the story and then jumping back to a different part and, and kind of seemed nervous. Um, in parts of in her interview, she was crying and still displaying the nervous behavior. Um, and you're almost six years of experience as a police officer, um, is that type of behavior and mannerisms uncommon? Um, not uncommon for domestic related calls.
So when you um, respond to a domestic and you're speaking with a, a victim, this type of behavior is um, fairly typical. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah. And what does she tell you about why um, you were there that day? Objection, Your Honor. It's going to call for hearsay and the response. Response? Your Honor, um, the people are uh, attempting to elicit statements about hearsay or that are hearsay under 768.27C. Um, the officer has already designated himself as a police officer. Um, we've already uh, heard testimony that it was a domestic relationship. Um, and uh, I believe that the statements that Ms. Uh, Officer Allman could provide uh, would provide a basis uh, for the rest of the requirements under that statute. I just need to elicit a little more information in order to lay that basis. All right. Response, Mr. Sertz. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, objection to the grounds that any testimony here taken is going to be inherently unreliable and cannot be trusted because Your Honor's already had a chance to review a video of the alleged incident. They've already made it very clear that this witness is here and she could testify to her own recollections as to what happened. So her alleged statements, and we still don't even have the foundation for the time frame as to when she allegedly made them uh, to this officer are gonna be inherently unreliable, untrustworthy. Uh, further, there has not been a sufficient enough foundational basis established yet that would allow these statements to come in under the exception that's a potential violation of Mr. Payne's uh, due process rights uh, to allow a prosecutor to essentially use a loophole here to get around her uncooperating witness to try to bring in her statements through this way, especially when she's here. So, you know, based on the fact that the court has already had a chance to review a video of the alleged incident of what is anticipated this officer is going to describe, and based on the inherent unreliability of these statements that are going to be made at a different time frame, respectfully combined with the issues that she's here and she could potentially testify if she wished to do so under these circumstances. And that testimony certainly uh, is going to be potentially more reliable or more credible than what she allegedly told an officer hours or whenever the time frame is uh, previously. Uh, the defense would continue their objection uh, regarding these proposed things. Thank right. you. As to the, the foundation, um, uh, the only the only foundational question is the time frame that between the incident and the testimony given, uh, and then we can address. Uh, so, uh, so Miss Smith, if you lay that foundation, uh, then I'll address the other Mr. Sars's concerns concerning the 768.27C. I'm going to sustain the objection until I hear something on the time frame. Understood, Jenna. Thank you so much. Um, when you were speaking with Ms. Milliken, did you ask her about the events of that day? Yes. And what did she tell you? She told me that there was an argument that night uh, between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. Uh, that turned into an assault. So approximately, I'm not good at math, eight to nine hours previously to when you were speaking with her? Okay. And so um, you're, you're, that's the time frame. Correct, Your Honor. I'd like to just ask a couple more questions sure. that are relevant. Sure. Um, did you also come to learn what Ms. Milliken had done between approximately 3 and 4 a.m. and talking to you at 12.30 p.m.? Yes. What did she do during that time frame? She said she was at Sparrow Hospital receiving medical treatment. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, does your honor want to make a yeah i'll make a record in regards to uh mr sart's concerns concerning uh the the statute itself my understanding of the statute doesn't include whether the victims made available or not uh, availability is not a concern here i would say that the 768.27c domestic violence victim statement is hearsay but it's allowable hearsay under that statute uh in regards to um and there's a bigger question here it appears that the legislature has legislated this so that the, at least at preliminary examination, this is going to be used uh, to pierce confrontation. The preliminary examination, uh, which is now appears to be a trial right more than a prelim right, uh, based on based on some of the what I've read. But the statements for to narrate, describe, or explain the infliction or threats of physical injury upon the declarant, the action in which the evidence is offered is, is an offense involving domestic violence 
We've had both of those testimonies. Statement was made at, at or near the time of an infliction or threat of physical injury. Evidence statement made more than five years before the filing of the current action or proceeding. We're talking about an eight to nine hour time frame after hospital treatment. Uh, the statement was made to a law enforcement officer as indicated. So I indicate that there is trustworthiness here uh, in regards to uh, the, the, the victim is here but refuses to testify. We've had that conversation. I was able to see a video that was played uh, concerning the activity in the room. So that, that was available, available, but not all aspects of the stated uh, event were available uh, from the perspective of the video camera. Uh, and so I do find that the statement was made in contemplation or the statement was not made in contemplation or pending anticipated litigation. Uh, that, that at this point in time, I do find, I do not find bias or motive for fabricating the statement. Uh, and it is seemed to be cooperated, at least the events of the two individuals there and the assault was on parts of the assault were on camera. So it is cooperated by statements other than what's been indicated uh, by these by these statements from Rosemary Mulligan. So with that, I'm going to allow the statute to take to, to come in under 768.27C. And Ms. Smith, you may ask your questions. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Officer Allman, um, you said that Ms. Milliken told you that there had been uh, an argument around 3 or 4 a.m. Um, and then she went to the hospital. What did she tell you uh, about what happened between her and Mr. Payne that caused her to go to the hospital? She had mentioned that uh, Mark was upset that he had been robbed and she was telling him to go get his money. Uh, there was uh, some name calling back and forth and Mark had kicked her in the face and began punching her while she was on the ground. Um, she said that there was unknown bystanders in the room that broke the fight up. Uh, and she had left and walked to the, the speedway to get a ride to the hospital from a random person. When you were speaking with her, did you have the opportunity to uh, view any of uh, any documentation that would corroborate that she went and received medical treatment? Yes, she had her uh, Spiro Hospital discharge papers with her. Uh, Your Honor, the people would move to admit exhibit number two, which is contained on the flash drive. It's 96 pages worth of medical records. I do have three pages that I printed. I didn't want to print all 96 um, just for purposes of today. I've marked them as 2A, which is the 90211 certification for the records, 2B, which is Miss Milliken's uh, signed authorization for disclosure of health records, and then uh, 2C, which is page eight of the records and the, the page that I would be most concerned with uh, the court reviewing today. All right. And uh, so motion, motion to admit people's exhibits 2A, B, and C. Mr. Sartz, have you had the opportunity to review those documents? Thank you, Your Honor. I, I would just state an objection just to preserve this issue on record on, on completionist grounds. That this is just a partial sample that it could be used to introduce possibly for demonstrative purposes, but not as an exhibit because it's only a small percentage of the full exhibit the prosecutor is proposing. All right. Thank you. Yeah, as I, stated, class, as I stated, the full 96 pages is being asked to be admitted as two, exhibit two. Again, I they're digital here. Mr. Sartre can review them. These are just three pages that I chose to print rather than killing 96 pages worth of trees. All right. Well, I, I do find at this point in time, uh, the objection goes to a contextual uh, objection as to uh, the, 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 the full document being admitted. The, the movement, the, the admission with the motion is to admit exhibit two in, in its entirety and then two A, B and C are just magnified as published to the jury in regards to that, uh, in regards to that indication. Uh, I find that, uh, I find that, uh, so on the basis of the objection of the one of the completeness doctrine under the rules of evidence, I find that counsel, uh, Ms. Smith, has met her burden in, in, in admitting it all. And then Mr. Sartz, uh, Mr. Sartz always has the, um, I can always review all 96 pages. 2A and B and C are highlighted as part of the exhibit two. Is that my understanding, Ms. Smith? Yes, Your Honor. 2A, 2B, and 2C are just uh, pages that are contained within exhibit two digitally. All right. With that objection, 
uh, the, uh, with that objection, I'll, I'll admit exhibit 2A, 2, 2A, 2B, and 2C. Thank you, Your Honor. May I approach? You may. Officer Allman, can you go ahead and look at exhibit 2C? And uh, on there has Ms. Milliken uh, made a statement to medical professionals as to why she was at the hospital? Yes. And can you read for the court what that states? Uh, assault victim got into an altercation, patient, or PT, which I believe stands for patient, states she got kicked in the face, abdomen, and hand, completing a break hand. Uh, and is that consistent with the statement that Ms. Milliken provided to you when you spoke with her a couple hours later? Yes. Have you had an opportunity to uh, review the video recorded uh, of the incident that Ms. Milliken talked to you about? No. May I have the uh, television screen, please? You may. You do. You might. I don't know if the court is running. I, yep, I plugged okay. it in. All right. So this would be. Do you want them to exhibit one? Yes, Your Honor. This is going to be exhibit one that I'm showing. That's previously previously admitted exhibit one. Yes, Your Honor. I'm ready. I just. I, yeah, I usually it just comes. Try to unplug it, unplug it. Yeah, try to unplug in. it, plug it back in. Oh. Usually it just pops in. This feature is not allowed. It says receiving content, and then it says features not allowed. And I know it is because we've used that. So. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we've used it on exhibit one. Try one more time. <laughs> oh, yeah, so nice. There we go. All right, I'm showing you what's been marked as people's exhibit one and already admitted. Just go ahead and watch this video. I believe, I hope there will be audio as well. Of course you do. Yeah. Let me make sure I hear you for a while. Of course you do. Of course I am. Because you don't, you, you don't act fucked up now. Because you're not enough of a fucking dick. And I really don't do shit. You know, I don't fucking talk shit about shit. I fucking do everything you fucking tell me. Don't to tell me that. You can shut the fuck up and quit fucking bitching at me. Yeah, I'm done talking to you. You're talking about the job 10 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. You should have said that shit 10 minutes ago. Yeah. That's a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> Because you got the shitty attitude. Mm -hmm. Fuck you. You got no, shitty you attitude. Bitch. You didn't like what I said. No. Yeah, you didn't like what I said. Not you no, because you're fucking wrong. Because so you're fucking wrong. I will slap you back. If I slap you back. I will slap you back. I will fucking slap you back. Bitch, you gonna be I will fucking slap you back. You already know. Bitch, you, I'm done bitch, with this bullshit. You gotta I will you fucking fight bitch. you back. Shut the fuck up. Bitch, shut your dumb ass up. Bitch, you won't get another piece of crap. I don't give a fuck. Bitch, I should knock you the fuck up. 
Bitch, I, I, I just want to. Do it I so I can hit you back. I want to bitch you in the ass. Do it so I can hit your ass back. You ain't gonna bait me. Do it so I can fucking hit your ass back. I got the one standing up. You ain't gonna bait me. I got the one standing in somebody's face raising a motherfucking hand either. Follow my face, bitch. I'm gonna knock you. Oh, you still swinging, huh? Review of that video. Uh, do you believe that what you saw is consistent with the statement that Rosemary Milliken provided to you about what occurred to her that day? Yes. Uh, did Miss Milliken tell you how long she had been dating Mr. Payne? Yes, she had mentioned that they had been dating uh, since April of 2023. They didn't have any children together, but they had been living together most or all of their relationship. And was that at the 910 address? I'm not exactly sure how long they had been living there, but they were currently staying there, yeah. Okay. What else did uh, Rosemary tell you about her relationship with Mr. Payne? She had told me um, that it's been difficult to get out of, uh, that uh, Mark was holding her uh, identification documents, so her driver's license, uh, her credit cards, her debit cards, uh, her vehicle title, her cell phone. Um, she had told me before she had met Mark, uh, she never used narcotics, um, and Mark had been forcing her to use narcotics and blowing them in her face. If she refused to do the narcotics, um, I'm going to object to all this because it's not in the statement that I've received uh, in terms of the police report. So I don't know where this officer is just making this stuff from. It's absolutely is in the response. It's absolutely is in the police report. And if the defense attorney would like for him to read straight from his report, I'm happy to have him do that. All right. Uh, if it's in the police report, then there's been. Or maybe the defense doesn't have the full report. May I approach? You may. So the objection is sustained at this point up until you can review your report and see, make sure it's in there. All right, go ahead and review page three of the report I just handed you specifically in the middle section. Yes. Does that uh, refresh your memory? Yes. And did you write that after you had talked to Ms. Milliken? Yes. And it's still your truthful remembrance of that conversation today. Yes. Rosemary explained to me that Mark keeps everything she needs to be able to get away from him, including her driver's license, bank cards, vehicle keys, vehicle title, cell phone, food stamp cards, etc. Rosemary explained prior to meeting Mark, she had never used drugs and didn't live this sort of life. Mark has been making her take drugs. Rosemary explained Mark would blow drugs in her face, hold drugs in her face until she does them, and explained that if she doesn't do them, there would be an assault. Rosemary advised she isn't allowed to have anything of her own. Rosemary has tried to leave Mark, but previously advised he stops her. Rosemary explained she had been assaulted by Mark many times, and she has not reported any of the incidents. That's what you wrote? Yes. Thank you. Where's that? Page three. Would you like my copy? Oops. Just want to make sure your council has the full report. It's part of the initial report, Your Honor. It's the very first page of the report. With that understanding, uh, th the testimony has already come in uh, through the attorney and the witness, but I'll, I'll rule the the objection at this point. Thank you, Your Honor. Have you interacted with the victim's boyfriend, Mr. Mark Kane, previously? I had, uh, I had not met him face to face uh, before this incident reported, but I had. Uh, then after it was reported. And is Mr. Payne present in the room today? Yes. Could you please point to him and identify an article of clothing he's wearing? Right there, he's wearing a dark navy blue button. Uh, Your Honor, identification for the record. Any objection to the witness identifying the defendant for purposes of freedom? Uh Yes, Your Honor, a lack of foundation. Because 
you know, this identification would be based on the hearsay statements that he received at the time. And did he attempt to, and based on his identification here, respectfully, I don't think he, there's a sufficient enough factual basis, foundational basis for the ID. Thank you. The, uh, the previous statement that comes from the 768.27C statement, but also from the videotape, I would assume. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, I'll overrule the objection and allow identification of the defendant for purposes of proof. Thank you. I have nothing further. Mr. Sartre's cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. So you had a chance to observe that video, correct? Just now, yes. Yeah, yeah. and that's the first time you've reviewed the video. So you could clearly see that Ms. Milliken's hands went up in an offensive manner when the foot was traveling towards her face, correct? I would have to rewatch it. Okay, so you I weren't paying that it. close attention to it, were you? I was watching it, but I wasn't sure the exact moment she was getting assaulted, what she was doing. Okay, so you never saw her hands clearly rise towards her face uh, when, she, when there was a moment when she claims that uh, when there was a moment that appeared that there was a foot moving towards her face, correct? I, I, I don't recall. I have to rewatch the tape. You don't recall. Okay. So even though you just watched the, the video approximately how many minutes ago, you didn't see her hands raised towards her face uh, when the foot was moving in towards her face, correct? I cannot 100% tell you that I saw that. I would have to rewatch the video. I saw a moment of the video uh, a few minutes ago. I don't recall. So. Did you ever see Mr. Payne's foot even strike her face? I don't recall. You don't recall? I, I don't believe it was in the frame of the video. Okay. So you didn't see Mr. Payne's foot actually strike her face. But you claimed it was reliable based on what Ms. Nelkin uh, told you previously, correct? Yeah. Okay. So you also testify that you didn't talk to Ms. Milliken until how many hours later? Approximately eight. Eight, okay. And you didn't have a chance to review the video at the time, correct? Correct. When you talked to her? And approximately how long did you talk? It would be an absolute guess. I would say a couple hours I was with her. Okay. Did you, did she mention anything about a broken arm to you? Yes. Okay. And presumably, since you testified about the medical records, you've had a chance to re review her medical history? Not her complete history. I've reviewed the form that she had with her discharge form. Okay. And she did her, when you saw her, was her arm in a cast? Yes. Was her arm in a cast? Not her hand, not her, not a split. I, from what I recall, it was her whole arm was covered in what appeared to be a cast, including her hand. Okay, but you have a chance to review her medical, but you did not have the opportunity to review her medical records, correct? Not the entire, entire so, of her records. So you don't know if her arm was actually broken. Correct. Uh, I believe the medical records I read said that there was a possible fracture or broken, something was broken in her right hand. Her hand, not her arm. Her hand and or arm. I don't recall what exactly it was. Okay. You don't recall. So, but your testimony here is what she told you was reliable at the time that you took her stand, correct? Yes. Okay. And did you do any follow up with her? Did you talk to her afterwards? No, once she, once we separated after this incident, I, I haven't talked to her since. Okay. And did you test, did you check with her and see if she might've been intoxicated at that point, high at that point? I don't believe so. Did she mention anything to you about threatening to rob somebody during that conversation you had with her? Your Honor, relevance. It goes to relevance because it goes to her credibility and it goes to the reliability of the statements that she was making. How loud, overruled. I don't recall. Did she mention anything to you about smoking crack herself or using crack that day during your statements with her? I don't recall if she said that she had used that night, but I know that she had told me that she had been forced in the past to use. Oh, she, so she admitted to you that she'd used crack that, uh, that evening. Right? I don't believe she admitted crack. Okay. And so there's a lot, safe to say that there's a lot that she told you, but you didn't testify to her, correct? Yeah. Okay. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Redirect to Ms. Smith. Thank you, Your Honor. Good 
Superintendent Sproul, right? Exhibit 1 on yeah. you just today, uh, and then you were asked some detailed questions about it. Let's review it. Uh, so, so far in the video, the argument has been uh, oral to my remembrance. Your Honor, first of all, yeah, I just, no, to preserve this, so just to preserve this whole farce, in my, respectfully, of, oh, it, okay. of a police officer being shown a video later on to be asked to testify about the credibility of a statement that he got nine hours later, just to preserve this issue, I'm just going to object All right. to this witness even being shown this video in the first place. The Thank whole you. goal was to try to test the reliability of the statement at the time, Your Honor, and this witness has now been allowed to see proofs and other evidence uh, in order to bolster this witness's credibility about his recollections about the reliability of the alleged hearsay statements by Ms. Mills. Thank you. With the, your objections noted, uh, you may proceed, Ms. Smith. Thank you. And just for point of clarification, I'm showing an admitted exhibit to a witness, which I believe is allowable. Mm -hmm. So I want you to watch this and pay attention. Who uh, in the video strikes who first? That's my question to you. I fucking do everything you fucking tell me. Don't don't tell me. me. You can shut the fuck up and quit fucking bitching at me. No, I'm done talking to you. You're talking about the job 10 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. You should have said that shit 10 minutes ago. Yeah. That's your name too. <laughs> because you got the shitty attitude. Fuck you. You got no, the shitty attitude. You didn't like what I said. No. Yeah, you didn't like what I said. Like, you no, because you're fucking wrong. Because you're fucking wrong. I will slap you back. If I slap you back. I will fucking slap you back. Bitch, you gonna I will slap you back. You fucking wrong. You already know. Bitch, you gonna be you back. Bitch, you I'm done with this bullshit. You got I will fucking fight you back. Shut the fuck up. Bitch, shut your dumb ass up. Bitch, you won't get another piece of crap. I'm the one that's going to get you. Bitch, you won't get another piece of crap. I don't give a fuck. Bitch, I should knock you the fuck up. Do it. Do it. Do an assault on that video? Yes. Who struck who? Uh, Mark struck Rosemary. Did Rosemary strike him back? No. Did you back? Did you, you ain't gonna hit your ass back. Do it so I can fucking hit your ass back. I'm not the one standing up. You ain't gonna make me. I'm not the one getting in somebody's face raising a motherfucking hand either. Follow my face, bitch. Just you another assault? Yes. Who was the assault? Who struck who? Mark struck Rosemary. With what? His foot. Into her what? Uh, face area. And have you observed her strike him back? No. No further questions, John. We may this witness be excused from the people. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, from the defense. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, without, without, uh, so thank you for your appearance today. Uh, you're excused. Any further proofs from the people? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Do the people rest? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, any proofs today, Mr. Sartre? Yes, the defense, the defense requests to call witness Rosemary Milliken to testify, please. All right. Uh, so you're going to bring Miss Milliken to testify here? Sure. All right, Miss Wilson, Miss Milken, you can sit. You, you got to stand right there, ma'am. Thank you. No, no, you got to stand right in front of me. Oh, okay. I apologize. Please state your first name and your last name for the record. Rosemary Milken. Okay, state, uh, spell them both. R O S E M A R Y M I L O I K I. Okay. Please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear from tell the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury. I do. All right. Go ahead and have a seat. Uh, Mr. Sartz, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, could you state your name for the record, please? Rosemary Milliken. And Ms. Milliken, do you recall events on uh, December? No, I do not. I would not like to testify. Okay. Uh, Ms. Milliken, uh, do you know any of the parties present in the proceedings today? Yes. Okay. What do you know? And where is that person located? Mark Payne. Good. Can I ask you some questions about what happened on December 11th, 2020? 
I would not like to answer any of these questions. Okay. I would love to speak with it. All right. You understand you're under oath? You're under subpoena, correct? Yes. You're informing the court you refuse to testify? I am. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Any follow-up questions, uh, Ms. Smith? No, Your Honor. This time, the witness has answered the subpoena, refused to testify. I was made aware of that from the prosecutor's office. Uh, Mr. Starts has attempted to have the witness testify. No direct has taken place. Uh, she's been placed under oath. Uh, Your Honor, I would disagree. I think that direct testimony has been provided. She did identify the defendant. She did. That's correct. She did identify the defendant as the person that she was once in a relationship with. Yes. Uh, and then you had the opportunity to cross on that. I did, and I chose not to. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, may this witness be excused from their subpoena at this point, Ms. Smith? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Sarks. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, ma'am, you're excused. Thank, Thank you. you. May I have just 30 seconds, Your Honor? Yes. Off the record. So we're off the record in 2400396, uh, taking a brief adjournment. And uh, Ms. Smith, you had the opportunity to uh, to speak with the victim in this matter. Is I that did, correct? Your Honor. Thank oh. you for allowing me that All time. Right. Um, so without any further proofs from the defense, uh, Mr. Sarks. No further uh, witness testimony today. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, motion for bind over, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, based on the proofs that were provided to this court today and the previous day, Your Honor has had the opportunity to witness what happened in this room multiple times, which is a unique situation. We don't usually get to see domestics on film. I think it's extremely clear what happened here. Um, the two were in a verbal altercation. Uh, Mr. Payne rose, struck Miss Milliken once in the face, laid back down on the bed, uh, continued a verbal argument. He then struck her with his foot in her face. Uh, got up and continued the altercation onto the ground uh, where he was on top of her to the point where a third party witness uh, was screaming and interfering, trying to get him to get off of Miss Milliken. Uh, Miss Milliken stated that they had been in a domestic relationship for several months, that they had been living together uh, for the majority of that relationship. That in the course of that relationship, Mr. Payne was extremely controlling, having all of her belongings um, possessed to him forcing her to use uh, illegal drugs to further his uh, control and power over her. Uh, Your Honor, um, on this particular date, the assault rose to the level where Miss Milliken needed to be hospitalized, pointing to plaintiff's exhibit two, specifically C, um, uh, states that uh, she would like an x-ray of her hand. Uh, she's in 10 out of 10 pain, that she was kicked in her face, abdomen, and hand. Um, and that she has had this happen before in the past. So um, Officer Allman did observe uh, the victim in a cast later that day, showing that she did indeed uh, have great bodily harm, a broken finger, arm, whatever it was, is clearly uh, an injury that is great, um, in addition to other injuries that may not have required a, 
a cast or a brace or things of that nature. He did have the intent to brutally harm her on the state. Um, there's no other intent when you kick someone in the face um, than to cause them great bodily harm, Your Honor. So well, respectfully, I ask that this court bind this matter over to circuit court uh, that the uh, additional misdemeanor and the habitual notice follow the felony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, response, Mr. Sartz. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, respectfully, due to the officer's recollections of Ms. Milliken's statements, the officer's testimony, nor uh, Ms. Milliken's statements themselves are reliable enough sufficiently uh, for bind over here. Uh, Your Honor, very clearly, there are serious doubts about the credibility of Ms. Milliken's statements. Further, she was here. She could have testified to them. Uh, she has informed the court. She defied the court's uh, subpoena and court's orders and refused to testify today, which obviously raises serious doubts about her credibility. And further, as for this officer saying that, that it was consistent with her claim that she got kicked in the face, you watched the video, Your Honor. You had a chance to observe uh, the alleged motion. You could clearly see that her hand was raised and blocked uh, the alleged kick to the face. And respectfully here, uh, at best, I think based on the video, perhaps uh, there, there might be some evidence of an alleged uh, uh, aggravated assault, perhaps, but certainly the prosecutor has not met her burden as it relates to showing uh, the necessary elements for assault with a great bodily harm less than murder, Your Honor, which is the count here, which is the uh, the, the felony count here. And uh, respectfully, there are too many inconsistencies with the statements, both from the hearsay statements of Miss Milliken that are clearly contradicted, not only uh, from the video, but also from the medical evidence. Uh, there was no medical evidence that supports uh, any claims that she got punched in the face. No, no, uh, nothing in, in the records that's going to suggest that she had any uh, fractures or any of the more serious bruising or anything along those lines. You're certainly the prosecutor brought it in all 96 pages of it. So your honor is free to review uh, the medical records. But a lot of what she claimed uh, to the officer was not substantiated. Uh, granted, you know, she did have a broken finger. Uh, that much has been introduced and that much is in there. Uh, but respectfully, uh, there's too many inconsistencies with the rest of her claims uh, to warrant those statements as being credible. And further, obviously, this witness had every reason and motivation to potentially lie and fabricate her story. She admitted to the officer that she'd been using uh, the, on the video and in the previous testimony. She threatened to rob somebody. All these raises serious questions about her credibility and her motives to lie about what allegedly happened here. And sure, uh, there, there was a video recording of this, but as you can see, Your Honor, very clearly, both of the parties were very angry with one another, and she did slap back. She did punch back. So respectfully, Your Honor, there's just simply too many questions about her credibility here, and there's too many questions about the credibility of her alleged statements to the officer uh, nine hours later for that to carry much weight. And then further, she obviously has a lot of motivations to fabricate and, and uh, potentially lie about what allegedly happened here. And the defense at this time would request that this uh, case be dismissed, Your Honor. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, the response, Ms. Smith. Briefly, Your Honor, I just want to note that while great bodily harm was suffered by Ms. Milliken, uh, no physical injury is required for the elements of the crime of great bodily harm. Uh, assault to commit great bodily harm. Um, that's pursuant to Harrington, which is a 1992 case, and I'd be happy to provide that to the court if necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the standard for preliminary examination is probable cause, probable cause being the second lowest standard in criminal law. Uh, the court uh, the court finds what's undisputable by probable cause evidence, and that would be the testimony of Sarah Wilson, uh, detective, and Trevor Allman, the officer, uh, along with exhibits 2A, 2BC, and exhibit one, uh, which was uh, entered on March 1st, uh, that this occurred on or about December 8th to December 9th of 2023 at the location of 910 American Road, Room 110, City of Lansing, Ingham County. That's a vid video of City of Lansing, Ingham County. So location, venue, and date is met, are met. There were several identifications of uh, Mr. Payne including exhibit one, which is a video of the event, which we, which is unique uh, on some level. Uh, but I believe identification has been made at a probable cause level. So the offense, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna indicate, there are some inconsistencies concerned to some of the testimony, what was said 
but uh, as exhibit one does is the video and it does without a doubt have at least a what starts as a an assault on miss milliken uh two punches to the face it would appear and then off camera there's an enormous amount of punching hitting uh requesting that the defendant stop his actions towards the complaining victim so as much as another witness comes uh and and attempts to remove him um so that the 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 the, the assault was started and then continued and continued and was finished uh, by the defendant. That A lot of that's on camera, some of it's off camera based on what was told. Uh, so I will take this, uh, take some of the hearsay statements uh, under 768.27C to fill in some of the blanks, but it is obvious to the court under probable cause that the defendant did make an assault upon Rosemary Milliken with the intent, which is the men's rate to do great bodily harm, uh, less than murder, uh, pursuant to count one, there is not only a kick to the face, there's several punches to the face, and then repeated, I, I lost count, five to eight to ten punches after the fact in which people, in which one witness is trying to remove him. Uh, I find probable cause to bind over on count one. Count two, which is the aggravated domestic assault, indicated the relationship of the, of the defendant to the victim. Uh, and that this the uh, the aggravated assault, which is a one year domestic of violence, indicates uh, that there was not only serious injury inflicted pursuant to two A, B, and C, at least a broken hand or arm, uh, in regards to some of what was indicated, uh, but re also repeated hitting uh, on the videotape. Uh, I I find uh, there's certainly plenty of evidence. It is a misdemeanor, so it goes over to with count one. It'll be bound over to follow count one, which is a felony. And then the uh, habitual offender fourth notice also follows all the way. So I'll bound over as charged. Based on the two witnesses testimony and the exhibits. And I will sign the bind over document. The examination was held on today's date which is April 4th. I'll bind the case over to circuit court as charged. Mr. Uh, Mr. Payne, your time in district court is done. You'll get your next date from your attorney, Mr. Sartz, concerning an arraignment or waiver of arraignment in circuit court. Uh, this case is bound over as charged on, on these counts. Anything else from the people, Ms. Smith? Your Honor, we also are set for a uh, bond violation hearing today. Um, I don't know what Mr. Payne's intent is uh, uh, as to that proceeding. All right. Uh, Mr. Sartz, we do have a PA-53 no contact order based on some of the contact, conduct. Uh, how did you want to proceed on that today? Or do you want to leave that up to argument? Thank you, Your Honor. Well, uh, in terms of proceeding, of course, uh, Mr. P Mr. Payne is not in a position uh, where he could admit to anything related to right. any allegations along these lines for very obvious reasons. So we're going to have to insist on running a hearing here uh, due to the risk of additional charges. Uh, so our position would be is that that will leave that to the court's discretion. Mr. Payne has already been bound over. So I, I just simply, I suppose I would raise an issue questioning whether the court has jurisdiction at this time to preserve that. Uh, but at this point, uh, Mr. Uh, Payne requests his hearing. Uh, Ms. Smith, uh, the courts had the opportunity to see evidence from prior ad of evidence uh, concerning this matter. Uh, how did you want to proceed today? Or did you want to stand on the evidence that's been supported by the preliminary examination? I'd like to stand on the evidence, Your Honor. All right. The court finds, based on really the review of the video and not so much the confrontation, the hearsay testimony pursuant to 768.27C, but there's no question in the court's mind that the PA 53 no contact order uh, in regards to direct or indirect contact with, with Rosemary Milliken has been violated. Your Honor, the, the video was the, a description of the alleged incident, which would have been before Mr. Payne would have been arraigned and charged. Do we have any evidence on the phone contacts? Your Honor, I don't know that it's a uh, no contact order violation. I think it's just simply a bond violation that Mr. Payne was on bond at the time that this offense was committed and that by committing another crime, he had 
violated his bond. But that was my understanding of the proceeding. The proper forum for that would be circuit court, Your Honor, where the court that he was under the jurisdiction of at the time and uh, under the supervision of the court. He was not on bond before, Your Honor, at the time of the allegations here. I have the the complaint for violation of conditional release is do not have any direct or indirect contact with Rosemary Milliken. And then I have reason to cause to believe that on February 18, 1052, the defendant violated those conditions by multiple phone contacts with Rosemary Milliken from February 18th to December 23rd, which would, would be after this fact. Understood, Your Honor. I was misunderstanding what the uh, allegations of the violation were for. Understanding that I would, um, we would need to take testimony, Your Honor, and I, I can provide that testimony, or not myself. I can provide a witness to provide that testimony here. Do you have the witness here today for that? Yes, Your Honor. Detective okay. Wilson. All right. Uh, and, and, all right. And that would, that would be the, the, I think that's who filed the complaint. Yes. Understood, Your Honor. Thank you right. for you clarifying can, that for me. All right. So you can call your first witness as to the PA 53 violation, uh, which is a separate entity from the bind over notice. Uh, this would be new testimony. Uh, so you may proceed on the no contact order violation, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, people will call Detective Sarah Wilson. Your Honor, I just to preserve this issue. I'm just going to state my previous object on the grounds the court doesn't have jurisdiction at this point because the matter's already been bound over. Correct. I understand this is a separate issue concerning the no contact order uh, uh, other than the preliminary examination. Uh, with that understanding, I'm going to hear evidence on it. Uh, so the objections noted and, and, and overruled at this time. Ms. Wilson, you can come up here. State your first name and last name and spell them both for the record. Sarah Wilson, S-A-R-A-H-W-I-L-L-S-O-N. All right. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm? Tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty. All right. You may, uh, you may proceed, Ms. Smith. Uh, please project to the back, and the recorder, the recording is for the court recorder, ma'am. Certainly. And, uh, Ms. Wilson, what is your employment? Uh, I'm a detective with the Lansing Police Department. Detective, how long have you been a sworn police officer? Uh, a little over 15 years. As part of your roles and responsibilities of a detective, are you given access to the phone call system at the Ingham County Jail? Yes, I am. And do you have an accurate understanding of how that system works? Yes, I do. And are you able to uh, look at and hear calls made by inmates at the Ingham County Jail through that system? Yes, I am. Did you look up um, Mr. Mark Payne's account through the jail system? I did, yes. Um, and did he make any phone calls that were of interest to you? Yes, he did. Uh, Why were they of interest to you? Uh, there were approximately 10 calls um, to a phone number um, that, based on the context of the calls and the uh, situations they were discussing, uh, they were to a female who um, was evidently Rosemary Milliken. And how did you believe that it was Rosemary Milliken's phone number? Uh, they talked about uh, specific things. He, he made 10 calls from his own account, but there were also six additional calls from three other inmate accounts to the same phone numbers, or the same phone number, I should say. Uh, that phone number within the system didn't wasn't actually associated to anyone in particular, but there's an area in the system where you can see where public users um, do uh, some sort of orders within the system. And it was uh, in the record as associated to her credit card she used for the orders. And uh, when you saw that the defendant had made uh, calls to the to Miss Milliken, why was that of interest to you? Uh, because there was a pretrial release order in effect and he's not allowed to have contact directly or indirectly with her. Did you note the date that that no contact order was put into place? I believe he was arrested on February 14th. It was the 14th or the 15th, I believe, that the order was in place. And when you looked at these calls, uh, were, those, were the calls made before or after, let's say, uh, February 15th, just to be safe? Uh, after February 15th. All of them? Yes.
No further, uh, no further questions, Your Honor. Cross examination, Mr. Stokes. Just to leave this briefly, do the parties ever identify themselves in the calls that you report that you listen to? Uh, in the first call, uh, he refers to her as Rose. And then in another call, she refers to him as Mark. Okay, but no, no last names, no other identification, correct? Not, not regarding their names specifically, no. And you've never talked to Mr. Payne yourself, correct? That is correct. So you don't know what Mr. Payne's voice actually sounds like, correct? I guess I've seen the video from the hotel and whatnot. Um, but. Yeah. Uh, have you ever talked personally to Rosemary Milliken? Uh, no, I have not. Okay, so you don't know what her voice sounds like either, other than what you might have heard on the video. That's correct. Okay, so Your Honor, I, I've got to object, object to uh, the testimony here just based on lack of foundation and lack of personal knowledge. Thank you. I understand the objection that's noted for the record. I'm going to overrule it this time and, and lead counsel to argument concerning the no contact order. Uh, any further questions, Mr. Sarks? No, Your Honor. Thank okay. you. Uh, may this witness be excused, uh, Ms. Smith? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Sarks? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Uh, you're, you're excused, witness. Thank you for your appearance today. Thank you, Your Honor. Any further proofs, Ms. Smith? No, Your Honor. Uh, do the people rest on the PA 53 violation? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, any proofs today, uh, Mr. Sarks? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, summation or, or, um, uh, closing as to uh, the PA 53 violation, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Your Honor. Of course, you can take uh, notice of your own judicial file and see that uh, Mr. Payne was uh, arraigned and ordered not to have contact with Rosemary Milliken on February 15th, 2024. Um, when Detective Wilson looked at the system, there were 10 calls directly from the defendant's account. Uh, six additional calls from three other accounts, which of course your honor knows is a, a common tactic of people attempting to evade no contact orders using other people's accounts. Uh, Detective Wilson was able to see that uh, the number associated uh, to that she believed to be most Miss Milliken, there was a credit card um, that was attributed to Miss Milliken with that number, uh, in addition to the fact that the parties were identified on the calls as Rose and Mark. Um, so I do uh, ask that this court find that there has been a violation of the no contact order. Uh, response, Mr. Sartes. Thank you, Your Honor. The defense would move to dismiss the allegations of the PA 53 violation at, the at this time, Your Honor. Obviously, there's insufficient evidence to convict Mr. Payne of these allegations here. Your Honor hasn't heard any of these calls. Uh, the witness here who testified doesn't know the identification uh, based on the voices of the people. All she's going on is essentially hearsay uh, evidence in terms of uh, you know, uh, list listings and, and accounts and, and references to phone numbers. But the truth is, is that we didn't hear any of these calls. So we don't really, there's been insufficient evidence to show who was actually talking on the phone calls. Further, there's no additional uh, evidence based on her testimony uh, that would individualize the purported statements uh, to the parties and, and obviously the contents of the calls uh, would all be hearsay potentially as well, uh, which were never in the contents of the calls were never admitted into proofs. So uh, respectfully, uh, you know, just based on having a detective come up and testify that a detective observed uh, some calls in a system and then purporting to have listened to them, but without ever hearing a single one of these calls, Respectfully, that is insufficient evidence to convict someone of a, a PA 53, especially when the detective here doesn't have any personal knowledge of what these people sound like, what their voices sound like, their cadence, or any other uniquely uh, personal identifying information other than uh, some print offs at the reading and, and some very circumstantial evidence uh, in terms of a connection between uh, the respective parties. So uh, respectfully, the prosecutor's not in their burden here. The defense would request that the PA 53's uh, be allegations be dismissed. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I find that, that the detective is testifying as to what was told to her she, uh, and what she listened to, although she doesn't have a, an association with either Mr. Payne or other than other than the association from evidence we've seen. Um, so I, I find uh, it is the court's no contact order at arraignment. I'm going to find that the Mr. Payne, uh, but I have serious, serious, serious concern that Mr. Payne is, is, is somehow contacting the victim or continues to contact the victim. 
I'm going to dismiss the PA 53 with no contact order based on the testimony of her. I'm going to continue the revoking of all Ingham County phone privileges, any phone, any privileges at all, except for uh, talking to the attorney. Uh, Cause I, I know that they can't, I know they can't record the speaking to the attorney. Other than that, uh, all, all phone privileges and meetings are, are revoked uh, except, except for the uh, defendant speaking with the attorney on the matter. And I'll dismiss the PA 53 at this time. There is a continued no contact order and there is a continued uh, uh, Ingham County jail phone privileges are denied and, and any visiting privileges are denied except for the attorney, uh, which raises this, which raises the issue of uh, indirect contact by meeting with somebody who may have some uh, contact with Ms. Milliken. That's all to be concerned at a circuit court level, uh, but the PA 53 is dismissed at this time. Thank you, Your Honor. If I could ask um, one additional uh, matter with respect to the phone privileges, uh, be it that the testimony was that potentially Mr. Payne was using other folks' accounts to contact the victim, I'd like to have the victim's number um, banned from the system, meaning that no person from the jail can call her. That works for me. Okay, so thank you, Your works. Honor. I also did an order as such. Uh, continued privilege in regard to the complaining victim's phone number uh, in regards to indirect contact, since there does seem to be at least the start of much indirect contact, and this is meant to put an end to any of that. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, anything else for the record, Ms. Smith? No, Your Honor, thank you. Anything, Mr. Sarks? Anything else, Mr. Sarks? Nothing further, Your Honor. All right, thanks. thank you. Uh, your, next, your next time will be in circuit court, sir. Ms. Wilson, let's go ahead and put the other case. Too many Ms. Smiths and too many Ms. Wilsons. Too many Ms. Smiths, too many Ms. Wilsons. But just so there's no ambiguity and I don't want to, I, I don't want to, there to be any bond violation in regards, is, is Ms. Bailey a part of this? She, um, Ms. oh, that might be, because I believe it's Bailey and Terra Novo, so yes. that might be Ms. Smith. Okay. So his first <laughs> trial on this case. Why? Because that's the date? I don't know. I'm a little confused. I'm trying to now, though. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we're back on the record in docket 24. All right, so it's Ms. Smith, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right, all right, so we're back on the record in docket 24-00632. That's people of the state of Michigan versus Jonathan Timler. Uh, and I wanted to make a clarification on the record since we do have Mr. Hosky here who, who uh, we sent down to probation because uh, I wanted confirmation. And Mr. Ho Mr. Hosky, you may proceed. Spell your first name and last name for the record. And then, uh, and it is a part of the plea agreement. So I want to make sure that everybody's- Do you want appearances? Yes, appearances for the record. Once again, uh, Ms. Wilson. Abigail Wilson for the people. Ms. Uh, Smith. Sherry Smith, Your Honor, on behalf of my client, Jonathan Timler, I am appearing via Zoom and my client is appearing in the courtroom. All right, sir, you are Jonathan Timler, is that correct? That's correct. All yeah. right, thank you. So when we left this before, uh, I wanted confirmation to lift the no contact order. I was concerned about the GPS and the GPS being out there in relation to no contact order. I wanted some confirmation from the probation department uh, before the June 6th sentencing. Uh, uh, Mr. Hosky, I have a note indicating that you were uncomfortable lifting no contact order without some starting of therapy. And so you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, do you want me to say and spell my name? Sure, please. Heather Dahosky, H-E-A-T-H-E-R-D-U-H-O-S-K-I. -E okay. All right. Now. Um, so, yes, I did meet um, with the victim in this case. I also read the letter um, requesting the no contact order be lifted. Um, at this time, Your Honor, though, I have not met with the defendant. I have not read a police report. I have not done a risk assessment. I have not um, conducted my pre-sentence interview. And although I, I completely understand the position of the victim, I cannot stand here with the knowledge that I have and recommend a no contact order be lifted at this time. 
Um, it's my understanding that Mr. Timler has done one individual therapy session um, that is not domestic violence based therapy. Um, and so at this time, I, I don't believe that as an individual of the court where my number one priority is safety of a victim is okay for me to recommend the lifting of a no contact order based on the information that I have today. All right. And so what are you looking for in order to lift the no contact order? So typically my pre-sentence investigation report with the um, risk assessment done um, I like to know, you know, where the defendant stands in all of this. I certainly would like to read a police report to see what the situation actually involved. Um, you know, the defendant's culpability, what responsibility did they take in the event? Um, if there's any remorse, if there's any understanding of power and control, things like that um, would be things that I would determine at my interview. And then, of course, we always like to see someone be involved in treatment to at least have done an assessment through the treatment agency, as well as the initial weekend of services, so that they start to get an understanding of how their actions have landed them where they are, right. and some culpability in that. All right, and so, so, I, so you, know, I've now heard from the probation department, Miss Wilson. How does this relate to the plea agreement? Thank you, Your Honor. The the agreement asked in the no contact order was that I would not object to the no contact order being lifted. I have not objected, so I think the plea stands. Right. Um, and from what I'm hearing, it's not that the no contact order isn't going to be lifted. It's that we just don't have enough information right now to make a determination. All right. So I I think at this point. What needs to happen is we just need to proceed with the usual matters here. Maybe Ms. Smith can coordinate getting Mr. Timler into that weekend before his interview even. Um, and so he can have that all done and maybe um, once that information is given. And if there is a recommendation for the no contact order to be lifted, probation can contact your office about that ahead of the sentencing date. Um, but at this time, I, I'm not objecting to the no contact order lift being lifted. I'm leaving it to your discretion um, and with the understanding of what the probation agent has put on the record today. And Ms. Smith, is, is that your understanding? I want to make sure that you, that you understand the nature of uh, the, uh, the prosecutor is not objecting. However, you've heard from the probation department now. Uh, Ms., so, uh, so Ms. Smith, I'd, I'd like your comment for it uh, for the record. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I appreciate probation's um, input on this, and I understand that there are cases, and she's not as familiar with this case, but Your Honor, you had the opportunity to hear the, the plea um, this morning, and not to minimize my client's actions, but it, it was not the most egregious offense, um, and you heard um, Ms. Timler's statement that she's not afraid of him and she would like him to come home. It is true that he began counseling last week. I cannot recall what the name of the agency was. I know he has another one scheduled this week. We've had discussions about him attending domestic violence classes. I know he's ready and able to do that. I believe he feels remorse. And I'm asking that the no contact be lifted as soon as possible, if not today, because June 6th right. is quite a ways away. Right. And, and so I, I'm going to follow the probation department's recommendation with one caveat. Uh, I agree. You don't have enough information. Uh, I, and that 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 placed us in it. So I was looking for guidance from you because if we were placed in a precarious position. We don't have a lot of information. You, of course, need a PSI risk assessment. And then you want to make sure the treatment's being invested in, uh, not just going to, but actually being invested in. Um, uh, but if we can, if, if I, so if I get from probation after that's done, some letter in writing indicating that they're comfortable where they're at, and it can, it can obviously be pre-date June 6th. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. Uh, I believe we have an appointment scheduled for his pre-sentence interview right. and risk assessment already. I believe it might be 23rd. the 23rd. Okay. Um, and I, he certainly is welcome to pop down to probation. We can provide him with the information on where he can get enrolled in domestic violence counseling immediately. We can make that referral and give him that information um, so that he can definitely get started on that and, and at least get that assessment and that portion going. Right. Um, and, and certainly then I can um, provide the court with an update once I meet with Mr. Timler on the 20th. We're, we're, we're looking at it as it, uh, sooner than the June 6th date, 
Uh, Mr. Timler, you, of course, you've you've done anything requested of you. There's going to be more. But what we're looking to do is is to get a answer previous pre June 6 so that we can make some informed decisions here. OK. All right. Uh, so I'm not lifting the no contact order at this time and you're still on GPS. That that'll be a part of the um, of the uh, the pre the post order the the, the post uh, uh, guilt order uh, and then I will look for any recommendation from probation in order to lift that so we have no ambiguity about the violations. All right, sir. Uh, anything else for the record in twenty four zero zero six three two, Miss Wilson? Nothing, people. Uh, anything else, Miss Smith? Nothing further, Your Honor. All right, we're all set. Thank you for your appearance today. Thank you, Your Honor. And then I think I'm just going to call, call out in the hallway real quick. Waited around for the, yes. for the end of that. <laughs> One, one moment, Your Honor. <laughs> so that was Mr. Payne. 